Hello, my name is Marcus. I'm the compiler of a collection of therapy quotes entitled Psychoanalytic Self-Awareness Quotes. This is TQ948. Therapy quote number 948. A successful feeding experience generates a feeling of a contented, loved self in relation to a loving object. The frustrated need generates a sense of a hating self in relation to a dissatisfying, hurtful object. These loving and hurtful facets of experience, or part-object relationships, are isolated from one another because it is too dangerous for the infant to love the object he hates and hate the object he loves. Instead, the infant uses denial, omnipotent thinking, idealization, introjection, projection, projective identification to rearrange his internal object world in an effort to separate endangered aspects of self and object from their endangering aspects. Associated with the use of these defense mechanisms is the fantasy that one can better control an object that is within oneself and the fantasy that the projected object is no longer within. The paranoid schizoid position is in ascendancy, according to Klein, 1984, in the first three months of life and is followed in the fourth to seven seventh months by the depressive position. The term position is used to refer to a, a level of psychological organization with its modes of defense, types of anxiety, etc. The paranoid schizoid position is, quote, schizoid because in this phase the infant relies heavily up upon splitting of self and object as a defense and mode of organizing experience. It is paranoid because the infant relies on projective fantasies. So this is one of Melanie Klein's theories that the baby, um, she calls it uh, the two positions. Um, so The baby, um, as I understand it, the baby in the in the womb uh, only understands himself uh, and everything around him. Sort of, he he's merged with it. He's one with it. He thinks it's him even. So the theory is, if we were to imagine what the baby's thoughts might be regarding his experience in the womb, it's as if we imagine he might think he were a little god. It's all about him. He has a need, it gets met. He has a wish, it gets met. He's perfectly comfortable, doesn't need to make any effort. He doesn't even need to think that he has a need. He just has the need and it's met. So he's so powerful, he's so powerful that way. So that's why we say he's a, he thinks he's a little god, because he's so powerful that way. So the jargon for this uh, is infantile megalomania um, after birth. So after birth, this continues in the extended womb period from birth to six months. So from birth to six months, that's considered uh, a continuation of the womb life from a psychological point of view because humans come out of the womb too early, so mothers bond with the baby and the baby is still held and contained and loved and supported. And the mother meets all of the baby's needs just as the mother, uh, mo mother's uh, body met the baby's needs when the baby was in the womb. So the mother continues that, that's called the holding function or maternal reverie, and the mother's attuned, she's bonded. It's called a secure attachment style, basically, for six months. Now, what happens is that uh, no mother's perfect, that's understandable. No mother can replicate that womb life after birth. Uh, so what the baby does in the interim as a as a way of dealing with the anxiety of when the mother is uh, unavailable, is that the baby creates two images of his mother. 
and then denies one of them and thinks that this other image is not even the mother. So it's a huge distortion of reality. That's why it's called the schizoid aspect uh, of this position. So this first uh, three months in particular, uh, this happens uh, during the first three months. So paranoid uh, client, <laughs> client calls this the paranoid schizoid position. Emphasis on the word position. Uh, again, the word position is used to talk about how the child is using the splitting defense mechanism and then denies one side. So it's very unreal. The mother's one person. She's not two people. The mother's a human being. She's not uh, a goddess or a demon in the baby's uh, fantasy world. So it's very unreal. That's, that's what he means by that. Um, so these images are wildly exaggerated uh, because of primary process thinking. The baby just thinks in images, um, and uh, because of the baby's small size and how helpless he is and how dependent and weak and needy he is, and the mother from the baby's point of view is like a giantess in the nursery. So if this giantess is frustrating, the, the baby's memories, uh, the baby has an impression of this otherness as being very frightening. Plus, because he's fused with the mother still, his angry emotions uh, influence his own impression of his mother so because he, he's blurred there is confused so the end result is this image of a frightening monster or creature right so myths and fairy tales talk about the splitting defense when they portray characters as the good in the myth it's some kind of wonderful goddess creature and then there's some demon or frightening creature or in the fairy tales the fairy godmother or helpful characters then you have the frightening witch or the scary animal that kind of thing that's the splitting defense of okay. That's an attempt to describe, in theory, the baby's, how the baby is living in, in his feelings in relation to his mother when the mother's being uh, frustrating. Yeah. So, again, uh, that's called the splitting defense or the defense mechanism of splitting. It's just temporary. So, the baby's ingenious that way. He comes out of the womb, he expects and needs the mother to be perfect just like things were perfect or blissful, oceanic oneness, heavenly bliss, it's all perfect there. The baby needs that to continue, but it can't continue. So the so that huge anxiety. So the the anxiety uh, is so, so primal. The client calls it, uh, sometimes she calls it persecutory anxiety, and sometimes she calls it annihilation anxiety, because the baby thinks he won't exist if the mother is not going to feed the baby. So there's a huge, immense anxiety there in the first three months. Right? Um, so to deal with that Im immense anxiety, the child has to just, in his fantasy, just, okay, he'll, the baby will bond to the mother when she's good. Uh, if the mother's bad, uh, he'll think that's not his mother, and he'll reject that. He won't believe that that's his mother. Yeah. That's called the splitting defense. Uh, this is temporary. Uh, by the age of three months, the baby begins. He get on the fourth. Here he says the fourth month. By the fourth month, the baby gets inklings that the mother is one person, not two people. Uh, and then from four to seven months, uh, these split images, goddess and demon images, start to come to closer together and meld. And then a new image is created uh, based on the mother as a realistic person. A human being person a whole person the same person the baby loves and is sometimes annoyed by but for the most part the baby loves and appreciates right? um, now when these uh, split images come together uh, the child uh, is, is healing or is uh, no longer no longer needs to use the paranoid schizoid position um, of, of the defense mechanism of splitting. Um, when the split images come together, they come together, by the way, when the child feels safe and loved enough. So if the loving memories of the mother outweigh the frustrating memories, the split images come together. Now, during the time the split images come together, from, from the fourth month to the seventh month, uh, that's when they start to come together. Uh, that's called the, the, the depressive position. Now the child has a feeling, if he's going to get angry at his mother, 
that means he's gonna hurt the one he loves. So there's a little depressed, sad quality about it. So that's uh, a little more realistic. This depressive position is it's a, an accomplishment, uh, he says here. Right. And then, um, and this continues actually uh, until the age of three. Um, and by the age of three, finally, uh, the child gets a, a, a fuller appreciation of the mother's one person, and uh, and his image of himself as separate and psychologically autonomous. That's called whole object relating. That's sort of Melanie Klein's model there. So from birth. Just for simplicity's sake, I've been saying from birth to six months throughout the series. So from birth to six months, uh, the child uses the defense mechanism of splitting. Okay, um, and then uh, by si at the age of six months or seven months, the split images come together. Right. That allows the child to differentiate from the fusion with the mother. Um, so he gets a basic sense of self. Uh, at around six months because he's able to psych psychologically leave the mother. He he gets a sense of boundaries, like who is he is and who his mother is. They're different people. Whereas before, it's all just him. The mother's just an object, a thing, an extension. It's called part object relating. The baby's relating mainly to the breast mother. So he thinks it's it's like in the womb. The womb is a, an extension of him. It meets his needs. See, so the narcissistic pattern, arrested development in this early phase, resembles that. They think it's all about them, the world's their oyster, everything should serve them, they're so important, and uh, they should only receive, they, don't have to, they shouldn't have to give anything. That's, that's the baby's situation. He, he shouldn't have to give anything. He should, he should receive the love that he needs to grow and develop. Yeah. Um, so, uh, okay, so the first phase is called a paranoid schizoid. Uh, position, uh, meaning the defense mechanism is being used, uh, the splitting defense mechanism is being used. Um, now the child can't differentiate while he's using the splitting defense mechanism. The split representation uh, of the others being loving and frustrating, they have to come together as a whole other uh, for the child to differentiate so he's a whole self. Because in that early stage of splitting, there's a part representation of the other that's satisfying linked to a part self-representation that's satisfied. And then you have a part other representation that's frustrating and to a part representation that's frustrated. That's the splitting. So the two part self-representations are split. He doesn't have a sense of himself. The two part self-representations have to meld and come together. Aha, now he has a sense of self when the two part self images come together. That's, that was the, the first part of that here. Again, the successful feeding experience generates a feeling of a contented, loved self in relation to a loving object. Okay, A frustrating feed generates the sense of a hating self in relation to a dissatisfying, hurtful object. These loving and hurtful facets of experience or part object relations okay are isolated that's splitting right are isolated from one another because it is too dangerous for the baby to love the one he hates and to hate the one he loves so again the representation the baby's understanding of his mother is split into two the mother is either satisfying or unsatisfying that means the self-representation is loved or rejected. So who is he? The child doesn't know. If the split self-representations come together in correspondence with the other represent, the split images of the other coming together, uh, they happen simultaneously. Reparation of the other and reparation of the self happen at the same time. Right? Forgiveness. Uh, so later on, later on, we say forgiveness uh, leads to happiness because. Two images are coming together. We're recognizing the mother as a person, so that's forgiving her. Uh, and then that the self-representation, uh, the two parts self-representations come together. 
So self-reparation and self-reparation happen at the same time to go together. Someone said you can't even really tell them apart. Um, so when the two parts self-representations come together and they differentiate uh, from the mother. Remember, the, uh, from birth to six months, that's called the stage of undifferentiation the stage of symbiosis, the stage of fusion. The baby doesn't know where he ends and his mother begins. Okay, uh, So he doesn't know who he is. He's, he's one with this otherness around him. That's not... That sense of self means he has to leave the mother, get the key out from under mother's pillow, means to differentiate from the fusion with the mother. Right? If you're still in this state of fusion, you're like in this lostful, blissful state of dreaminess like you don't you're not really yourself right um, now when you psychologically differentiate from this fusion with the other aha now you feel oh now I, I have I, I recognize I am a me you know that kind of thing um, so that's a major theory you know defense mechanism that's a major thread in this series uh, the concept of the, the splitting defense we've been using Rinsley's quote uh, splitting precludes differentiation. If the splitting defense mechanism is still being used later on, that means he doesn't differentiate. Right? If he doesn't differentiate, doesn't know himself, doesn't know himself, he can't achieve mutuality, he doesn't achieve mutuality, he doesn't achieve the psychological birth, he doesn't achieve the psychological birth, he doesn't have access to the real self. One of the capacities of the real self is a wide range of affect, so if the person in later life needs to mourn the loss, the real self will allow the person the necessary appropriate affect to help the person mourn the loss. So Rinsley says splitting precludes mourning. And if the person doesn't mourn losses, that can lead to complicated grief, aggravated grief, prolonged grief, chronic sorrow, burnout, soul loss, possible nervous breakdown, uh, stress on stress, the symptoms of PTSD. And that can lead to, as one person said, um, to becoming a curmudgeon, not an elder. So the curmudgeon is bitter, miserly, stingy, angry. He's still battling with the mother because he's still fused with the mother. He didn't differentiate because he's still using the splitting defense. Yeah. So that splitting defense is just, the theory is it's, it's okay for the baby to do that. But it's not okay if the split images don't come back together again. Ideally, maybe the baby would never need to create these unrealistic images of the mother. But that's the dilemma. Humans come out of the womb too early. So to, to manage that anxiety, the baby creates split images and denies that the mother's frustrating. He has to preserve that heavenly feeling that the mother is so wonderful. Right? And the only way to do it is to delude himself, to, to lie to himself. Or, so the baby's ingenious that way. Um, but this, again, the splitting defense mechanism is meant to be existential hearsay by the age of three. If that's still being used beyond the age of three, that's, a, that's considered a developmental trauma, the rest of development, a fixation at the rejection level of not getting enough love to differentiate or not getting enough, or if the person does differentiate, um, but they don't get enough support to complete the process between six months and 36 months, then they're fixated at the rejection level of not getting enough support to complete the separation individuation process. At least to the codependent pattern, the hysterical pattern, or overly emotional pattern. Um, now, the fixation in the first six months, we covered in previous videos, that can lead to the narcissistic pattern. Um, the theory about that is that um, the baby interprets uh, mother not meeting his needs. The baby feels, uh, we think that he's being devalued, humiliated, shamed, exploited, objectified, used and all that. So the baby can't deal with that. Uh, persecutory anxiety, annihilation anxiety. So it's so severe, the baby just identifies with the aggressor. It's the last effort, right? He, he becomes like the mother. He just becomes the mother. So his mother's impinging, engulfing, demanding thoughts, they become his thoughts. So he's identified with the aggressor, okay? That is, and uh, the, that's the narcissistic pattern, meaning when he grows up, he puts, he does to others what his mother did to him, to communicate that when he was a baby, that those things that he's doing to others, he wants to communicate that those were the things that his mother did to him. So he's caught in the repetition compulsion of doing to others what his mother did to him. And he spends his whole life, like Sisyphus, repeating it over and over again, doing to others what his mother did to him. So from the baby's point of view, the mother put him down, objectified him, used him, exploited him. So the person with the narcissistic pattern does those things in 
later life. They put others down. So all that humor, that dark humor, the humiliating humor, put down humor, shame, sardonic humor, sadistic humor, all that put down, but all that hurtful humor. That's uh, how the baby felt when the mother didn't meet that person's needs when they were a baby. So he's, he's trying to uh, communicate how he felt. So he's doing to others what his mother did to him. Okay, So the, the baby thinks he was objectified and used. So a person with a narcissistic pattern doesn't see others in their subjectivity. He thinks they're just breasts to be used, to be consumed or get some extract some benefit from. Because uh, that's what the baby needed at the breast to extract the benefit from the breast. So the narcissistic pattern objectifies others, exploits others, use others. They'll use rationalizations, they'll come up with excuses to make it sound fine. But he's motivated by the developmental trauma of doing to others what his mother did to him because he's trying to communicate that that's what his mother did to him. And he's stuck there. The baby couldn't communicate that. The little baby at the age of two months cannot say, hey mother, are you objectifying me and using me? And are you, when you're not meeting my needs, do you realize how I feel? Uh, when you're so misattuned to my needs, do you realize I feel so shamed and humiliated by this? The baby can't express all this. That's a trauma. So the child thinks, okay, he'll identify with the mother, become just like her, and then do to others what his mother did to him, to, as if he's communicating to his mother still in his mind that that's what the mother's doing to him. He's, he's demonstrating. It's called action language. He's acting out. He's doing to others what his mother did to him. Right? Because remember, primary process thinking, the unconscious is timeless. So he's stuck in this timeless world. So a person with a narcissistic pattern can spend his whole life trying to tell the world, everyone around him, anybody... Really, what he's doing is trying to tell his mother, this is what you're doing to me. I'm going to show you by doing it to others. Don't, aren't, don't you get it, Mar? Aren't you listening? Uh, it, this, it's a secondary delusion because he's, he's operating from this unconscious template uh, from the world of timelessness. And that's what's influencing him. The psyche seeks wholeness. So the person wants to be witnessed. The person wants to be recognized. Grief is healed when it's witnessed by a caring other. But the iron, but the tra the sadness of it is when he's putting others down. Uh, no one's going to say to them, "Were you put down as a baby?" Because that's what you're doing to me. Maybe that would help, but he would be enraged. That maybe. So that's why a therapist is very skillful about this. So Masterson has an approach to deal with this. So he's made a huge advancement about healing a person with a narcissistic pattern. Robert Bly keeps saying, get the key from out from under mother's pillow. You've got to differentiate from the mother. But to differentiate from the mother, the person has to realize he's identified with the mother, that he is her. He doesn't want to admit it because that's his identity. Right. Another pattern uh, that comes out uh, from this early, uh, from fixation at the rejection level of not getting enough love to heal the splits and differentiate is uh, the hostile provocative attachment style. The theory about that is, one person said, is the person prematurely was prematurely ejected out of the symbiotic egg orbit. So that, that those first six months, that was like an egg, a symbiotic egg, like a womb. It was like an egg, a psychological egg. They refused to there. So the image is like a kind of like a psychic egg, an invisible egg in the mind, the mind kind of thing. So the baby was ejected prematurely out of this egg. In other words, he didn't get enough love to, to leave the egg. He was ejected out of the egg way too early. Now the person develops the hostile provocative attachment style. In other words, he's enraged uh, at the mother for being ejected out of the egg because he needs the love to leave her. Now he can't leave her. Now he's stuck with her. And now he's trying to master the trauma of going around uh, searching for another person, in theory, to fuse with them to be the mother. No one can do that, of course. It's a secondary delusion. No one can be for that person what the mother, what that person needed as a baby. You know, it's biologically, physiologically, evolution. It's impossible. No one can do that. Right? After the age of five, someone called it uh, uh, pathological repetition. It's patho so, he's, so the person is hostile and provocative towards others. The author says he's trying to communicate that he, was, that he didn't get his symbiotic needs met. So the baby needed his symbiotic needs. He didn't get it. Now he's... In the repetition compulsion, he's trying to communicate it. He wants 
to, to master the trauma. So he's trying to communicate the problem. So he's communicating by his action, by his behavior. His behavior is to be hostile and provocative towards others, okay, and so on. Um, another pattern uh, that comes out of this is, uh, someone called it, uh, hiding behind power struggles as a character defense. So one variation, uh, she says, is uh, there was a real battle at the breastfeeding. The baby was never attuned, it was a constant battle. So the person likes to create arguments and quarrels because uh, he's unconsciously trying to master that trauma of the breastfeeding problem. Another pattern is the schizoid pattern, the one that resembles the character Iago. So, um, in the narcissistic pattern, um, uh, the image uh, of what the baby needs is an inexhaustible flow of goodness. So the breast was an inexhaustible flow of goodness. But the baby was never satiated, he never got enough love. So that's his understanding of what he needs. Now in the repetition compulsion gone awry, the person's going to think, well it's not enough just to receive love, it's better now to possess it. Now he wants to own symbolic mother. Anything that represents goodness or symbolic mother, he wants to possess it and own it. So that's the greed. Okay, and because it's like Sisyphus, he's going to keep on doing it. The client calls that introjective destructiveness because he'll keep on doing it because he can never be satiated. He can never be satisfied. He can never be enough. Okay, um, the baby never experienced uh, satiation. So the greed is endless. Right? And... Um, now, if the person with the narcissistic pattern sees something that's symbolic of goodness or symbolic of mother, uh, and they can't get it or possess it, they'll be envious of it. So envy means hatred of the good, and if they see the, this goodness spoiled or damaged, they feel gleeful as the schadenfreude. Now, the schizoid pattern that resembles the character Iago from literature, that person apparently doesn't even bother with the greed. He's only at the envy. So he sees everything around him from a point of view of envy. He wants to see what's around him be, to be spoiled and damaged. So he, uh, in that story, he uh, spread rumors and uh, got people against themselves and saw others quarrel amongst themselves, and he was gleeful about that. So Glass called that emotional sadist. He was the sadist. Or the, uh, he called that gleeful at that deep level the emotional sadism was from there the narcissistic pattern we're calling the schadenfreude if he feels the stress relief the tension relief of being greedy but sometimes he can't get his greed needs met his greed needs met um, and then he's envy and if he sees the goodness destroyed he feels schadenfreude so there's the grenvy there in other words the narcissistic pattern has grenvy greed and envy but the person with the schizoid pattern resembling the character Iago from literature, he doesn't have the greed really. He just has the envy only. Right. So he's more, um, because you know, schizoid is emotionally detached, so he's very detached, emotionally detached. So he's cold about his calculating and scheming. and right. So he's uh, one of the most... Uh, it's, uh, I don't know if any therapist has been able to... Um, I, yeah, I think some therapists have books about how they would approach trying to heal a person with a schizoid pattern, uh, with, that, with that particular version of it. Another pattern that comes out of this phase, birth to six months, the paranoid schizoid position, uh, is the symbiotic character disorder. I still don't know much about it. I'm still waiting, uh, still hoping to find... So I'll, I'll update that because I'm curious about that. Um, there was some mention about it in previous videos. Um, it, maybe it's something about they didn't get their... So of course they didn't get their symbiotic needs met and they're still in that state of fusion. Um, but they're more manipulative about it and uh, they're more they're more active about it using the symbiotic... I, I can't come. I don't know. So hopefully we'll follow up on that one. Another pattern is the closet narcissistic pattern, also discussed by Masterson. The closet narcissistic pattern, this is the person that doesn't overtly uh, engage in so much uh, um, greed and envy and, and uh, spite and vindictiveness and all that. 
This person just associates with someone who is like that and then basks in their glory out of the fusion with that person. It's not the codependent pattern, it's the closet narcissist. Sometimes they're confused. The codependent pattern will get tired of it and uh, will, will leave um, because the person with the codependent pattern ha has love and gratitude. Uh, but uh, they use a defense mechanism called sweet lemons. They'll think the person with the narcissistic pattern is so wonderful until they wake up. But the person with the co uh, sorry, the person with the closet narcissism, they're just as hungry, greedy, envious, spiteful as the person who's overtly doing it. He's just doing it in the his is just closeted. So Master says they bask in the glory of the other person's narcissistic greed, and they bask in that way. So they may be a, a common pairing, I suppose. And there are, yeah, a couple of other, I haven't done the other patterns. The, there's the bully pattern, the socio, some of the more severe patterns of the criminal. There are more severe patterns related to the rest of development during the first six months. So this paranoid schizoid position is a real, it's very important for mothers to be more loving than frustrating. If the mothers are more frustrating than loving, the splitting, the baby still has to keep on using the splitting defense mechanism. Then he's stuck there. It becomes a psychic structure. Sento psychic structures like that. Uh, this is all healed naturally when the mother is more loving, more attuned uh, than otherwise. Then it's okay. The baby's healed. The, baby, the mother just needs to be good enough. The mother's perfect. She just needs to be good enough. So that's one of the most famous phrases in the psychology, psychoanalytic movement. The mother just needs to be good enough. So that's uh, very fortunate uh, for, for, for the child. Um, okay, uh, okay, so we'll just continue on this theme. Next part. The infant must be able to split in order to feed safely without the intrusion without the intrusion of the anxiety that he is harming his mother and without the anxiety that she will harm him okay so again life force is object seeking the baby must bond to the mother at all costs okay there's that's the anxi annihilation anxiety the baby must bond to the mother for his survival okay so your survival anxiety okay so now, if the mother is more frustrating, how is he going to bond? If he hates his mother, how can he relax and feed? If he hates his, all he wants to do is bite his mother. He doesn't want to relax and feed from his mother. So how does he do it? The baby needs to feed from. He, the baby needs to nurse and milk and feed. How does he do it? If his original instinct is or wish is to bite the mother because he's enraged. Um, so the theory is, the baby uses. The, this defense mechanism of splitting. The baby will create some fantasy that, uh, no, the this bad mother is not real. That's not my mother. That's what he'll think. So he'll deny that. And then he'll create a, he'll like hallucinate almost that this person, that this breast mother is good. And that's how he can feed. So he's surviving. The baby's ingenious that way, right? He has to trick himself, you see. Um, now, Fairbairn calls this mechanism the moral defense. It's a confusing term. What he means is the, the baby makes like a little judge. He's going to decide who's moral, what's... So the, the, the baby thinks, uh, no, the mother has to be good, and I'll, I'll take it upon myself that I'm maybe not good. So the, the baby's making the moral decision for his survival that this bad mother is actually good. It's a confusing phrase, um, but that's the baby has to feed somehow. He has to lie to himself. So he, he's using maybe the sweet lemon's defense mechanism. No, this bad thing is good. It's, it's, this lemon is not bitter. This lemon is sweet. This breast is not bitter, toxic. This breast is sweet and nurturing. So he's lying to It's a rationalization. He's deluding himself. It's like it's a delu now it's like a real delusion, right? So that's a primary delusion at that stage. If that psychic structure is there, in future life, that's called a secondary delusion when he uses when he does things like that. The codependent pattern engages in a secondary delusion.
Okay, uh, so that's how the baby is able to uh, feed. You know, sometimes the baby can't even do that, and then uh, the mother's forced to use, put honey, to use the bottle, put honey on the nipple. Wow, so the baby thinks the, the sweetened nipple is better than the. See, that's really. And uh, I think someone said anorexia comes because the baby is protesting so much he doesn't want to eat. So the anorexia thing comes from there because he's so angry at his mother. He, he wants to reject the mother. So the baby can't even use that delusion. You know, something like that. Okay, uh, so let's move on. Similarly, the desire, the ability to desire safely would be lost if the infant, while feeding, experienced himself as the same infant who angrily wished to control the breast mother. In other words, without the splitting defense mechanism, without using this defense, without this discontinuity between loved and feared aspects of self and other, the infant couldn't feed safely. See, the infant couldn't feed. He couldn't eat if he didn't trick himself in his mind like that. He couldn't do it. Jeez, you know, I think every mother's may want to consider reading Melanie Klein to uh, or to get a sense that how important it is for the mother to be attuned to the baby's needs. Because if the mother's not attuned, the baby's going to do a lot of damaging mental gymnastics. Um, now he may be able to recover from it by the age of three, but if he doesn't, uh, he's going to end up as a very dysfunctional, neurotic person uh, later on to one degree or another. Um, another way of saying this is, the paranoid schizoid position represents a breakdown phenomenon resulting from the premature disruption of the maternal holding environment. Okay, that's the extended womb in other words. A response, this is a response to the disruption of the very first basic interpersonal bond of the mother and infant. So if there isn't a secure attachment style, it can lead, that's some sort. Now, if, if there's a secure attachment style, the paranoid schizoid position gets resolved, leading to the depressive position, and then finally leading to whole object relations, and then leading to the psychological birth of three. So just again, Mahler's model is that from birth to six months, as the stage of symbiosis with enough love, the baby hatches out of that symbiotic egg, the splits are healed, the splits come together, they form a whole other whole self, and he hatches out of the egg, of the orbit with the mother. Okay. Now this hatching out process is gradual from 6 months to 36 months. But this hatching out, this getting the key out from under mother's pillow is a huge accomplishment. Because now we say that at 6 months with the hatching out, uh, with the differentiation, not the premature hatching, not the unmet needs, not, not the identification with the aggressor, See, the main emotions with those patterns mentioned before are anger, uh, greed, envy, or grenvy, spite, vindictiveness, schadenfreude, and others. So love and gratitude haven't entered the psychological picture because the baby's still too enraged at not getting his basic needs met to leave the mother. Now, if the child did get enough love and he does leave at the age of six months, we say that at roughly at around the age of six months, love and gratitude have entered the psychological picture because the baby got enough love as evidenced that he got, he was able to differentiate. He needed enough love to differentiate. So if he differentiated, we conclude, oh, okay, he got enough love. So love and gratitude have entered the psychological picture at the age of six months. Okay, so now that's the, okay. So, um... Now, between six months and 36 months, if he's frozen there, um, he idealizes others too much. The person will uh, project the loving mother onto everyone and think everyone else is so great, and they berate themselves. That's, so that's the hysteric technique uh, Fairbairn talks about. So, we'll, so f uh, in a previous video, we talked about the, the techniques. So, um, from birth to six months, uh, if there's trauma there, uh, Fairbairn says the person's going to use what he calls the paranoid technique, emphasis on the word technique, meaning the person's going to project this unknown, this unthought, unfelt, unremembered experience with the frustrating mother onto non-threatening substitute others, think that others are frightening, 
and they preserve their infantile megalomania. So they think they're good and others are bad. It's unrealistic, it's not true. The, hyst the hysteric technique from, birth, from six months to 36 months is the person does the opposite. They project the good mother onto others and they keep the bad mother within. Right? So they're hysterical that way. Others are so great and they're berating themselves right? because uh, the codependent pattern still wants more love and support to complete the process. Whereas the earlier stage, they're not there yet. They're still in battle with the mother to get enough love to differentiate. Right? So they, they uh, project the bad mother onto non-threatening substitute others and they're in battle symbolically with the mother through their projections outwards. So the, that's why they're negative and provocative and hostile and angry. And uh, they're angry at the mother still. They're, they're, uh, it's a repetition compulsion gone awry. Okay, uh, so he, he calls it here a breakdown in the maternal holding environment. So the maternal holding environment. So the, the babies in mother's arms, that's a holding environment. Uh, the atmosphere is safe. Um, maybe the, the, the baby doesn't feel that he's angry at his, at his father or her father. The atmosphere is safe. The baby feels safe. He still feels that he's in the womb. The holding environment means the extended womb or the social womb. Okay, now this, so let's go, let's stay with the paradise schizoid position. This splitting defense mechanism, okay, it's psychologically painful to have so many memories of the mother being so frustrating and to keep that within. Okay, so in response to this, projective identification. Projective identification develops as a psychological interpersonal elaboration of the process of splitting in which one uses another person to experience at a distance that which one is unwilling or unable to experience oneself. Okay, so the person doesn't want to experience these unconscious memories of the mother being so bad. So they'll just say that other people are so bad. That's projective identification. He's preserving the splits. He doesn't want to feel the splits. So his fantasy is he thinks other people are so bad. Not wanting to face is the internal bad object. So it's called externalization. So it's a momentary, it's another trick of the mind. Again, all of these psychological maneuvers are there to deal with the anxiety. Arrested development with an insecure attachment style, that's anxiety. He feels better if he can put others, say others are so bad. So he's always blaming others, focusing on others and looking for excuse to blame others. He doesn't want to look within. Okay, the Healing is to look within, to face the ambivalence, to bring this place together, differentiate and so on. Okay, so let's talk a little bit more about this projective identification. Projective identification, a process wherein the mother, okay, as, the, as object of a projective identification, she metabolizes experience for the infant, who is the projector, and then the mother returns the experience to the baby in a form that the baby can use. The mother's unwillingness to accept the baby's uh, projective identification is then internalized by the infant in the form of self-directed attacks on efforts to link thoughts and to generate emotional ties to others. So remember, the, the, the baby and the mother are fused. If the baby has a feeling, it's as if he's sending out the signal to the mother. So the mother, uh, now remember this baby can't think what he, the baby doesn't have thoughts about his distress. He doesn't really even, he, he, he can't probably even feel what he's feeling, but he's sending this signal out in some ways. His face is tense or his, uh, he's moving around or he's squirming or he's arcing his, he looks uncomfortable. Now the mother, okay, she, receives the message, she metabolizes it with her maternal reverie, she considers it, accepts it, loves the baby, the baby sees that and then takes that response back in. 
So that's projective identity. So the baby sends it out, the mother responds, the baby takes it, he feels better. Now if the mother doesn't do this, oh boy, the baby's stuck with his distressed feelings and he, he can, and he can, uh, and that means he's going to delink from the mother or, uh, well, he's still bonded to the mother, but he's, it's an insecure attachment style to the mother, something like that. Yeah, so that would be an insecure attachment style. If the mother's not safe and secure for the baby, that means the baby's not getting a secure attachment style. So if the mother's not offering her reverie, if the mother doesn't accept or metabolize the baby's messages, that's an insecure attachment style. The insecure attachment style, okay, there's the anxious, there's the avoiding, there's the hostile provocative, the disorganized, and so on. So there's different forms that can take. Okay, let's continue on projective identification. Projective identification is viewed as a process by which the infant's thoughts that cannot be thought and feelings that cannot be felt are elicited in the mother when the mother is able to make herself psychologically available to be used this way. Projective identification, according to Klein, is psychically depleting in that an immense expenditure of energy is involved in the effort to control the other so thoroughly that he is experienced as having taken on an aspect of one's own identity. Quote, insofar as the mother comes to contain the bad parts of the self, she is not felt to be a separate individual, but is felt to be the bad self. Projective identification is a coercive enlistment of another person to perform a role in the projector's externalized unconscious fantasy. Projection in general is an effort in fantasy to remove an internal danger by locating it outside of himself. So, if there's arrested development within the first six months, meaning the splitting defense mechanism is still being used, that means projective identification is still being used. So the, so the person, as an adult, uh, will coax others to feel what the projector's not feeling, to think what the projector's not thinking or can't think, to, or even to act out what the projector wishes he could act out or somehow. So he, he, the template is the mother was supposed to digest the, the baby's feelings and the baby would feel calm. Now, in, now as an adult, the person's still trying to do that. They want to get others to own, like the baby wanted the mother to own the baby's feelings. Now, the, in projective identification, the adult version of it, the projector wants some other person to feel it, uh, to deal with it, and then the projector can retake back to himself uh, or interject uh, how the other person responded. Right. Now, it's many, usually the other person can't do that if it's severe, so the other, so the projector will coax the other to play a role, to act it out, to keep it externalized. Now he wants to control the other to take on that role meaning he wants to control his ability to uh, keep on sending out the message to the other because he doesn't want to face the message within. He wants someone else to deal with his unconscious message sending. So he wants someone else to take, take the message. So to control that ability, he wants to control the other to play that role. So he'll coax others, manipulate others, push their buttons, uh, be passive aggressive, uh, deceive, try to provoke them to feel, think, express, act, do, demonstrate what is what would be a representation of the frightening object within. Right? So it's called externalization. Right? Um, so uh, the common example is with prejudice. The person has a, an image of the frightening mother as being some terrible uh, character there. They find some non-threatening substitute other, and just out of automatic fantasy, because they're safe, they're going to suddenly say, hey, that person is frightening. They feel relief already. Okay, it meets their psychological uh, situation of, to preserve the splitting defense mechanism. They didn't heal the splits. They, they're still stuck there. They're frozen there with the splits. 
so they're projecting a frustrating side onto a non-threatening substitute others, onto a non-threatening substitute other. Uh, then they think that the bad mother's out. So, so the baby, back to babyhood time, the baby does feel better if he's sending the message out to his mother. Hey, mom, I'm, I'm distressed. Are you hearing me, mom? So it's similar with the prejudice. Look, uh, this bad image of mother within me. No, you're the bad uh, mother. So the, the, he's feeling a little momentarily, momentary, someone called a psychic equilibrium based if the, if the psychic situation is based on splitting. So he's preserving the splitting. Okay. Now, of course, to hide this, he'll use rationalizations. He'll lie to himself. Remember the delusion? Remember how the baby had to lie to himself to feed? So he'll do something similar. He'll, deli he'll lie, use all kinds of fallacies, logical, false logic. He doesn't care. He has to lie. Like Just like the baby didn't care, he had to lie to himself that the mother was good so he could feed, even though he knew the mother was bad. So the same thing in the, in the adult version. He's going to lie that the other person is so bad, even though they're completely safe. Uh, but he's he's operating from the emotional need uh, to not feel the stress within yeah. at an unconscious level. So that's uh, projective identification. Now sometimes it's very benign. Two friends get together. Uh, so the, the projector friend uh, is feeling something feeling X okay the receiver feels starts to feel this X the receiver says hey buddy uh, you know I'm starting to feel this little X feeling I'm wondering if you too might be feeling this X feeling and the projector might say you know I'm glad you brought her up I am feeling this X feeling how did you know well because you're kind of coaxing me to feel this I I think that's what projective identification is about getting others others to feel and express what you're denying in yourself Oh, okay, I'm, oh, I apologize. I didn't realize. I'm glad you brought her up. So now they can talk about it. So it's very benign. They're friends. They'll talk about it. So they have open communication. Um, sometimes another version of it is uh, misery loves company. If the person's feeling sad, but he doesn't know he feels sad, he wants the other person to feel sad. He wants to coax that person to feel sad till he's externalized it. Now he sees the other person is feeling sad. So now he feels less alone. Misery loves company. Because when you're with others, the mammalian brain feels safer, the mammalian brain sends the person serotonin. Right? Um, now the more harmful version is the prejudice version is uh, um, this the splitting defense mechanism is used too too much. It's uh, it's too heavily it's too relied upon heavily. So the person has to keep thinking that uh, the bad mother's out and they have to keep on convincing themselves that the bad mother's out. Uh, because they don't want to face it within. Meaning, they don't want to face the unconscious ambivalence with the mother. They don't, want, they don't want to face the idea that when they were a baby, the mother was frustrating. They're in denial. Because remember, the baby had to lie to himself. In the repetition compulsion, he's still lying to himself. So it's a continuation of this lying. It's called a secondary delusion, from the primary delusion. So it's a continuation of the delusion, or the fantasy. Okay, so in other words... Projective identification is an extended elaboration, or is the is the is the arm of the splitting defense mechanism to preserve the splits. Okay, uh, an inability to diminish one's reliance upon splitting reflects excessive anxiety. Okay, around forgiving one's parents. They don't want to do it. They don't want to like, forgive their parents. If they think their parent was a goddess and the world's greatest mom and all these things, they don't want to forgive their parent. They're still using that that baby mechanism. Um, the reality is the mother was more... So we're talking about insecure attachment style. So the, with the insecure attachment style, the reality was the mother was more frustrating uh, than satisfying. So the person doesn't want to admit that. They're going to still using... They're going to still keep on using this splitting defense. Yeah. So yesterday's video was about uh, how on Mother's Day, that's the day when mothers come clean. Okay. And then uh, that's the day when uh, adult children forgive their parents. Yeah. So we're going to stop praising the parents on Mother's Day and Father's Day. Uh, 
we have birthdays to celebrate our parents. But on Mother's Day, that's the day when mothers say, look, I, I want to help. I, I have something I, you need to know. T talk about the birth trauma. Talk about the feeding. Talk about the truth of what happened. Then the, that's, that'll help the adult child to forgive the parent. So forgiveness and healing are the same. And same with the father. Uh, that'll help to resolve the splitting defense mechanism. Okay, so now let's move on to the next position. So that all of that was about the paranoid schizoid position, splitting, protective identification, right? Uh, using rationalizations to hide it, lies to hide it, secondary delusion, the projection is from there, uh, prejudice is from there. Prejudice is confession of the splitting defense mechanism. Prejudice is confession that they have a lot of unconscious memories of the mother being so frightening. So let's say the mother is more loving than frightening. The split images come together. Means we now enter into the depressive position. Entering into the depressive position involves a monumental psychological advance. The critical achievement in the attainment of ambivalence, okay, love and hate at the same time. Mother was both good and bad at the same time. Ambivalence, the critical achievement in the in the attainment of ambivalence, okay, the two sides of mother, is the fact that the person one hates is the same person whom one has loved and unconsciously still loves and hopes to openly love again. When one hates, the love that one had felt is still real and is present in the history that one shares with the loved person. Therefore, mourning is facilitated with the acknowledgement that history cannot be rewritten. Yeah, this author's metaphor for the paranoid schizoid position is that the person is always rewriting history. They're changing history. They're saying, no, the mother was uh, good. But the mother was bad, so they're changing history. That's his little analogy for this. Okay, so the ambivalence is, so splitting rejects the ambivalence, there's a, or there's an unconscious ambivalence. Still trying to figure out how this uh, lighting works. Huh? Okay, I think it's back here. Okay, so in the splitting defense mechanism, there is an ambivalence, but it's too much, so it's denied. Okay, so there's unconscious ambivalence. Now when there's more conscious ambivalence, the baby thinks, oh, okay, mother's loving but sometimes frustrating. Uh, if the baby's angry at the one he loves, uh, he might feel bad badly about it. So they're splitting there. So there's ambivalence there. Whereas in the paranoid schizoid position, there is no ambivalence. They deny, because there's two people here. It's just either Jekyll or Hyde, good God or bad God. It's just compartmentalized and separated like that. So they don't feel any kind of loss or guilt. They just rewrite history. They just change the facts as at will, uh, easily. It's, 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 right? Just how the baby needed to glue himself in order to feed. Um, so double thing comes from there, I guess. Uh, okay. So with with the with the attainment with the critical achievement, the monumental psychological advance of ambivalence. Okay. Now, uh, the person can mourn. Because you can only mourn a person if you see them as a person. You can't mourn a goddess or a demon. You can only mourn a person, because you can only love a person. Right? Um, that's his main idea there. So splitting precludes mourning. Okay, so when we heal the splits, then we can mourn losses. Again, Feelings, or I'll continue, feelings of uh, loss, guilt, sadness, remorse, compassion, empathy, and loneliness. This is not a dilemma that one resolves. One is stuck with it, with all of its advantages and disadvantages, unless one regressively flees from it into the refuge of the paranoid schizoid position or through the use of manic defenses. Yeah, this author makes the point that a person who is in the depressive position 
if they're under a lot of stress, they can revert or regress back to the paranoid schizoid position. So the paranoid schizoid position means there's wider feelings. There's love and gratitude, there's empathy and compassion, there's understanding and caring, but there's also loss, guilt, sadness, remorse, regret as well. So this uh, uh, wider range of affects, he's saying, you know, that's the human condition. It has advantages and disadvantages. Now, if you don't like it, uh, or, or if you don't want to face this ambivalence, you can just regress back to the paranoid schizoid position and say either everything is either extremely good or extremely bad. Uh, prejudice is from there, it's all good, this all bad, all X, Y, all the strong idealization, strong devaluation, there's all this in-group, out-group stuff, all, all this in... These kinds of, this splitting defense mechanism keeps things super simple, just like the baby had to keep it super simple in order to feed. You know. So this is the immature, infantile, some call it the primitive defense mechanism, splitting and protective identification. Um, it's meant to be existential hearsay by the age of three. Um, the adult mind uh, uh, relates, is connected to the real self, uh, and one of the capacities of the real self, the person having a real self, Okay, meaning they have, they've achieved ambivalence, they've achieved whole object relating, they've achieved ontological security, basic trust, sense of self, they've achieved the connection to the real self. They got the key out from under mother's pillow. The life force is connected to the self-representation. With access to the real self now, one of the capacities of the real self is a wide range of affect, appropriate affect. So if the person needs to mourn losses, um, the real self will allow that. If the person wants to be happy, the real self will allow the person to feel happy. If the person is curious and creative, the person, the real self facilitates curiosity and creativity. Uh, the real self uh, builds the person's self -esteem, genuine self-esteem by the expression of the real self. Because the real self allows the person knowledge of their uniqueness, their unique wishes, their, their individuality, their, how they're unique. right? So that builds, uh, so the real self gives the person a sense of natural entitlement to express the real self. That's meaningful. So the real self says that you can have meaning in your life by expressing your real self, and that fuels self-esteem, uh, the genuine self-esteem, not, not, the, not the inflated uh, infantile megalomania esteem, the, the self-esteem that comes from the real self, the meaningful self, is the connection to the self, self-esteem. Right? You have to have a self to get self-esteem, that kind of self, the sense of self, to get self-esteem, you need the sense of self, that self-esteem self, you know, that version of the self-esteem from having, based on the sense of self, ontological security and expression of the real self, that self-esteem from the real, so real self-esteem, let's say, versus the infantile, the grandiose self. Remember, in the paranoid schizoid position, infantile megalomania is still there. The person thinks they're still a little god, magical thinking, omnipotence, the thought is all about them. Uh, you know, Burglar says uh, to preserve that, you know, they can do use superstitions and he has a book on gambling. They, they, they preserve their infantile megalomania. They roll the dice, come on. And, and then, uh, what is it? Uh, lady Luck is the mother. Come on, Lady Luck, that's the mother. This time, love me, let me win. But Lady Luck is, is more refusing than satisfying. See, Lady Luck is more refusing than satisfying. So that repeats the babyhood situation, as burglars, one of burglars' theories there. So may I refer you to burglars' book, uh, The Psychology of Gambling, on that one. Okay, uh, another defense mechanism is a manic defense. So if a person is very manic and hyper-busy and hyper-manic, uh, so they're, they're avoiding uh, the, their grief and loss. Okay, just the last one here. So Melanie Klein viewed the infant as a distinct psychological entity from birth. Again, Melanie Klein viewed the infant as a distinct psychological entity from birth, one who adopts psychic maneuvers of the mind, known as defense mechanisms, to take care of himself in the face of unmet needs and misattunement. So she's making the point here, right at birth, the baby has this impression. Good mother, bad mother. 
in the womb was good mother. After womb, oh, well, there's this bad mother, but he'll deny this bad mother and think it's not the mother and think it's a different person. That's the splitting defense mechanism. All of these, so this, all of these quotes come from a book uh, called Matrix of the Mind by Thomas uh, Ogden. He included a couple of chapters on Melanie Klein's work. So these, these uh, quotes are a sample uh, from the chapters on Melanie Klein's theory. So Melanie Klein's the one that really advanced the understanding of the splitting defense, protective identification. The two positions, the paranoid schizoid position, um, and then the depressive position being a major accomplishment. Robert Bly says, get the key out from under mother's pillow. Then you're in the depressive position. Now you're a grief poet. You're, you feel loss and sadness and regret and, and love and compassion. So the wide, wider range there and so on. Okay, so this builds on previous quotes on Melanie Klein's work. So I'll just uh, leave it here. So I'll end with the, the theme song. So the theme song for this series is Windmills of the Mind by uh, Katja Epstein. Okay, so thank you very much. This has been TQ 948. So we uh, covered a few more windmills of the mind from the book Matrix of the Mind. So the quotes are posted below. Uh, apparently there are quite a few people out there who call themselves Kleinian therapists. They, uh, they believe and feel that people can be healed with an understanding of Melanie Klein's model and of the two positions and the understanding of these defense mechanisms. So the baby is a, the baby is a psychological entity right from birth, Klein says, who adopts psychological maneuvers of the mind. Right? To take care of himself, to survive, to deal with his huge anxiety. Okay, Klein uses this jargon, so Robert Bly says, forgive psychology for its jargon. Just forgive it, just forgive it, he says. So the jargon is an approximation, it's, it's an attempt to describe something invisible. A lot of this is based on inference and theory and based on repetitive behavior. We make inferences about what's lying underneath it. So, um, okay, uh, so splitting helped the baby to feed safely. So splitting was helpful for the child, but it's just a temporary device. If it's still being used, then that leads to prejudice and all like swall, all right thinking. Mother's a goddess. Or, Others are all good or all the out. Projective identification resembles the baby's efforts to communicate his distress to his mother with the hope that the mother will respond and soothe the baby. Now, in the adult version of that, it's amplified. The person is more active and more aggressive about getting others to feel or demonstrate something. One quote was very dramatic. He says, the coercive entitlement, enlistment of another person to perform a role in the projector's externalized unconscious fantasy. 
That's probably one of the most direct uh, descriptions of the most of the more extreme use of defensive uh, of uh, projective identification. Projective identification, the third one here, is the course of enlistment. Okay, you're forcing it, you're pushing others. Okay, course of enlistment. You want to get others to perform a role. Okay in the projector's un externalized unconscious fantasy. So the projector has an unconscious fantasy of a, of a frightening creature. That's the mother who is frustrating. He wants someone else to be uh, unpleasant. Now he's, now he's externalizing it. He feels a little stress relief that way. That's projective identification. Now this poor other person can't metabolize that. It, it's a secondary delusion. No one can be that person's mother. Their own mother couldn't do it. So how can some non right? If you're lucky, the therapist is trained in that area. The therapist may be able to help with that through his interpretations. Because now you want to understand this. If you're conscious of it, then you can heal it. Right? But nobody can't do it for you. The therapist can't digest that. Even the most skilled therapist can't digest that. Right? I, I, even Margaret Mahler couldn't, Mel, Karen Horney couldn't digest anyone's that kind of hateful projection onto. No one can digest that. So the therapist offers an interpretation, a transference interpretation, so the person can understand what's going on. Now the person gets a sense of his internal object relations world. Klein says we live in two worlds: the internal object relations world and the external object relations world. Fairbairn has this thing called splitting of the ego. The conscious ego deals with the external world, but the unconscious ego is dealing with this internal object relations world called the endopsychic structure or the architecture of the subconscious. Now in this internal object relations world are internal objects. So relating to these objects, there's internal objects. These are fantasized personifications of memories, clusters of memories which become fantasized personifications. That's an internal object. Now we got an internal object that represents the satisfying mother. That's a part of her that's satisfying. That's a part. So the satisfying part mother is linked object, internal object is linked to a part self-representation that's satisfied. So that's a relational unit there. So there's two internal objects there. Now the unsatisfying mother object in the internal world is subsplit into the enticing object part object and the rejecting part object because originally the baby was enticed and hoped in his idea that he's going to get his needs met but then the mother rejected it so the baby creates three images of the mother the loving mother the enticing alluring tantalizing mother and the rejecting mother so the enticing mother is linked to a self-representation that's enticed. The rejecting part mother is linked to a self-part representation that feels unloved and devalued. So now there's now you have these characters. Now there's probably more internal objects. So we'll just go with these for the for the moment, All right? And uh, so now these characters within these fantasized personifications of the memories. Satisfying mother, satisfied self, enticing mother, enticed self, rejecting mother, a rejected self. Okay, so these uh, are sometimes called imagos. Now the unconscious ego is holding like a little film projector, and he's gonna get, he's gonna get the person to think that some non-threatening substitute other or something in the environment, something external, whatever it could be a place, could be a location. Could be a thing, could be a car, could be the bird, could be any something external is one of these imagos within. The psyche seeks healing. The unconscious ego is doing this because the psyche seeks healing. The unconscious ego wants the conscious ego, because the psyche seeks healing, the unconscious ego wants the person's conscious ego to recognize that he is externalizing an unconscious fantasy of one of these imagos, of one of these internal objects. We live in two worlds. We have a relationship within and we have relationships externally in the interpersonal, physical, actual world. 
But this internal object relation so is fragmented, it's painful, it's hurtful, a lot of hurtful memories in there from babyhood time. So it's projecting onto the present. So it's distorting our present perception. You see? When we heal the internal object relations world and achieve inner harmony, okay, now we can see the now we can calm down and we don't need to project these frightening frightening images onto others out there. Now we can calm down and see the world in a relaxed way, right? The world's a beautiful place, we're all people, love your wounded neighbor with your wounded heart. We can respect everyone as people in their own rights. Each person is seen as a person in their own right. We can respect the reality of our mother as, as a woman in her own right. We can respect the reality of the father as a man in his own right. We can respect ourselves as a person in our own right. So we're achieving uh, the reality of people as psychological beings, as spiritual beings, as persons, human beings, as people. Okay? Now the baby doesn't see things that way. The baby relates to what Klein calls part object relating. It's just things. The narcissistic pattern sees everything as a thing. People are just utilitarian. You're just a thing I need, I use. Lucy Holmes says people with the narcissistic pattern regard everyone as symbolic breasts to be consumed and used and sucked dried and then left and rinse and repeat does it again to the next right so the playboys like the playgirl the playboys they're all like that they're just in the repetition compulsion of trying to extract of trying to say that they didn't get enough love from mother but no one in the present can make up for that only an interpretation only by consciousness can this be healed so the goal of therapy is to make the unconscious conscious to make the unbewoosed, all that's unknown, to make it conscious. Okay? Uh, so where it was, or where unconsciousness was, I shall be, ego shall be. Where it was, ego shall be. It just means the energy of the unconscious. Right? So we had, uh, we've been using all along throughout this series, Robert Bly's metaphor of the bag. So once again, by the age of five, so much of who we are, okay, gets put into this bag that we drag behind us, the shadow soul, or the second self, or the unconscious, or the secret self, or the second self. Uh, Karen Horn and I calls it the stranger within. And you want to get to know the stranger within, and you're going to like this stranger. Darrow calls it the skeleton. You want to welcome the skeleton, give him the best seat at the fireplace, treat him as an honored guest who had a right to be, who has a right to be, who's a wise teacher, who's teaching you that there's a conquest of the self, that we can find our real self, that we can heal, we can con there's a conquest of the self, it means we can heal. So he's teaching you how to heal, sometimes called the shadow self, the literature is the motif of the double, in, in one poet, one poet says, it's the one who walks with us, who's not like us, but who is us. Another poet says, there's someone living my life, I know nothing about him. Okay, so this is, this is us. This is all of us that we repressed in babyhood time and put into this bag. Okay. Now, as we re-own, reclaim, reintegrate, get back to ourselves, re-own, okay, something that we denied, we get it back, that's called psychosynthesis. So analysis, interpretations lead to synthesis. So psychoanalysis is sometimes called psychosynthesis. So we want to, the psyche seeks wholeness, that's synthesis. We want to re-own what we disowned about ourselves. Our feeling self is in the bag. Our ability to feel, most, many of our important feelings, our joy is in the bag. So we want to, right? So we are, I feel therefore I am. So our feeling self is in the bag. So when we get back our feeling self, now remember in Iron John, Robert Bly says, get the key out from under mother's pillow. That's differentiation. Now in the story, Iron John, when he gets the key from out from under mother's pillow, he takes that key and opens this cage. Now guess what's in the cage? There's a character in this cage called the wild man. That's, so the metaphor, if we personify the unconscious id, uh, one metaphor is the wild man or the wild woman. Now this wild man in the fairy tale holds a golden ball. Now this golden ball is the real self, is the 
is the, is the, is the wholeness, the quest for wholeness. So the protagonist in the fairy tale wants to get the golden ball. But the wild man is holding the golden ball. The unconscious character is holding the golden ball. And now this unconscious character, who's holding the golden ball, who's holding the golden ball, is in this cage. The only way to open this cage is to get the key. Where's the key? The key is under mother's pillow. So Robert Bly says, get the key out from under mother's pillow. You can unlock the cage. Now the wild man has a lot of emotions there. You gotta learn how to integrate it. He holds your golden ball, okay, and you have to have a relationship with yourself. So that's what Daryl meant. You wanna have a relationship with your unconscious. Sanford had that thing. You wanna have a dialogue with the wild man, with your unconscious. Now it's, you don't know him, it's, it's a stranger within. You gotta to get to know the stranger, so it takes time. So that's what Karen, that's why Karen Ho and I calls it the stranger uh, within. So that's another thread in this series, uh, Robert Bly's metaphor of the, of the shadow work. So shadow work uh, is sometimes called mental hygiene. So the mental hygiene movement, one author says, is about owning your projections, reclaiming what you disowned in childhood, get it back to yourself. In the fairy tale, that's symbolized as a, as a wedding. When you see a wedding in a fairy tale, that's a metaphor of re-owning something that you disowned in childhood. You brought it back together again, okay? Now this metaphor, let's bring it up again here. So here's the wedding here, okay? Now on the left side there, that represents consciousness. So the sun there is bright, you see it, you're aware of it. That's called the masculine principle. Now, you're unconscious, that's the moon there, the woman standing on the moon, that's the feminine principle. That's all that you don't know about yourself. Now, when you, with your consciousness, accept something that you don't know about yourself, see, that's, that now it looks like a wedding there. That's a marriage there. That's, that's a symbol. This image here is an ancient symbol called uh, inner peace. Okay, reconciliation, inner reconciliation. You can see the dove there, and you can see the spark there. That's the healing spark, right? That's the, could be the golden ball as well. So, the mental hygiene movement says you got to re-own what you disown. And that leads to emotional health, psychological health, spiritual health, and all that. So, men, so owning our projections, okay? Projection is confession. So if you're projecting, you're confessing. Prejudice is confession. The confession is, we can consider that when we were a baby, what was the childhood really like? Maybe the mother was more frustrating. That leads to the work of forgiving the parents. Now, how do we forgive the parents? Now, that's what I'm saying. On Mother's Day, that's the day when we forgive the parents. Now, how do we forgive them? The parents can help. On Mother's Day and Father's Day, they write letters to their adult children confessing, coming clean. That helps us to forgive them. Now, forgiveness means reparation of the other. Forgiveness means facing the ambivalence that we denied. When we face the ambivalence that we denied, we're healing the splitting defense mechanism. We're getting out of the paranoid schizoid position, entering into the depressive position, which moves towards the psychological birth and access to the real self and knowing ourselves. Then we get the golden ball. And, Mel, and uh, Shirley Temple says, then the, that's where the bluebird of happiness is, it's within. The bluebird of happiness is in that golden ball. But that golden ball is in the cage. We gotta get the key out from under the mother's pillow. Then we can open that cage. That's the metaphor. Right? And so on. Okay, uh, so I guess I'll just leave it here. So, the bottom line is we gotta forgive our parents. On Mother's, when's Mother's Day this year? Whenever it is, I'll look it up. On that day, we forgive our parents. Now, we can ask them for help. We can say, look, look, Ma, Dad, I, I want to forgive you, but I need your help. You got to tell me, really, what went down in my babyhood time. What? Tell me the truth. Okay, then that'll bring up feelings, that'll bring up ambivalence, that'll bring up the truth. The truth will, up, will upset us free. Okay, the truth, that means the, amb the ambivalence is the truth. The truth is the mother was maybe more frustrating than satisfying. That's the truth. But with that acceptance, we're healing, we're bringing the splits together. When we bring the splits together, 
we can then get the key out from under mother's pillow. Once we get the key out from under mother's pillow, we start to know ourselves. We can start to open that cage and get access to the golden ball. Now that golden ball in the story, remember? Uh, they go into the forest. Now the forest is a metaphor for this bag. Now this bag that we drag behind us, a symbol for it is the forest in the fairy tale or an ocean in a, in a myth. So forests and oceans are metaphors of the unconscious. So Odysseus was, went on this epic journey on the ocean, okay? So he was facing all sorts of things, okay? And when Odysseus got home to Penelope, he was reunited. That was the mayor, so he reintegrated what he didn't know about himself back to himself. Now remember in the movie, the ocean was speaking, Poseidon was the personification of the unconscious. So in the myth, so in, the, in one fairy tale, it's the wild man. In the one myth, it's the Poseidon. So the Poseidon says, look Odysseus, you're gonna start to feel ambivalence. That's what he means when he says, Odysseus, you're gonna suffer now. You're gonna feel what you didn't feel. You're gonna, you're gonna start, to, because before he wasn't feeling it. He was denying it. He was rewriting history every minute. This is true, this is not true, double think, back and forth. He was rewriting history, so now he's no, you're gonna stop doing that, Odysseus. You're gonna feel. That's what he meant in that clip. So we played that clip in the beginning of this series of a Poseidon telling Odysseus, you're gonna suffer now. And he means you're gonna face the unconscious ambivalence. That is a sort of suffering. This suffering was expressed right here. So Odysseus, so Poseidon was saying, look, feelings of loss, guilt, sadness, remorse, compassion, empathy, loneliness, all of these feelings, okay? You're stuck with it. You're gonna live with it. You're gonna suffer with it. It has advantages and disadvantages, okay, Odysseus? So Odysseus, you can remember in that movie, he was confused about it. He didn't know what he was talking about. So that's why it was an epic journey. It took a long while. Uh, Goldberg says, the reason it's such a long epic, it took 15 years or something, for Odysseus, or 10 years to get home, it's because he was very disconnected from himself. That golden ball in the bag there, it was deep, deep in the bag. Very deep in the bag. That wild man character was deep in the bag, in the cage. So you got this golden ball being held by the wild man who's in his cage, and they're deep in this bag. So that's called the hero's journey. So Campbell gave us this phrase, the hero's journey. It's the monomyth. We all have this, to some degree or another, we face this at midlife, right? Mead's metaphor is, you know, uh, the guy's in the forest, he sees a golden feather. Should he pick up that golden feather? That's, that's moving towards owning what you've disowned about yourself. The golden feather was a clue to the firebird. The firebird was the, the animation of the body, the being connected to yourself. The firebird is in the bag, in other words. That's your feeling self, right? So Michael Mead has that, uh, he tells a story about uh, the firebird. Okay, uh, I'd like to think that uh, all of these models and all of these quotes are helping us to be more aware. Grief is healed when it's witnessed by a caring other. We can be our own caring other. If, if you have the funds, you can, you can find a therapist and he'll help you. Be, but otherwise, uh, <laughs> the poor man's version of healing is to uh, uh, read these quotes and uh, not the poor. The common man's version of healing would be to uh, to do some reading and reflecting. Luckily, uh, a lot of this knowledge is available now. Uh, I'd like to think that this collection, psychoanalytic self-awareness quotes. When it's completed, this complete collection will be called 1001 Windmills of the Mind, in tribute to this song you're hearing now in the background, our theme song here. 1001 Windmills of the Mind, Psychoanalytic Psychotherapy's Greatest Hits. I'd like to think that I'm compiling Psychoanalytic Psychotherapy's uh, Greatest Hits here, at least some of them. Um, to my mind, if I can understand it, and if it's helping me, I, I feel it to be a, a hit, at least for me. Uh, and hopefully, uh, 
You know, this is the only the, the second collection of psychotherapy quotes, psychoanalytic psychotherapy quotes. Um, the first one was done back in 1990, so I, I'd like to think I'm updating it and adding some more to it. So when this uh, collection is complete, uh, it'll be called 1001 Windmills of the Mind, Psychoanalytic Psychotherapy's Greatest Hits. I originally wanted to call it uh, 1001 uh, Psychoanalysis's 1001 Greatest Hits, but it seems a little awkward to say that, so I, I'm updating it. So we're already at TQ948, so we're getting close to completion. I want to thank the two people that have donated so far. Thank you very much. I've sent letters to the to the two that have donated. Uh, very much appreciated. Um, one was anonymous, so I, I thank that I thank that person in the email. Uh, the one who uh, Professor Brunning, uh, Professor, helped me out. So I, thank you to Professor Brunning. Uh, I've mentioned some of her. I, I recommend her books. Uh, her earlier ones, in particular. Uh, one is called Meet Your Happy Chemicals by Professor Brunning. Another one called uh, Beyond Cynicism. Those two in particular are good. So, uh, yeah, donations are, are, are very much welcome. Uh, okay, so I'll just uh, leave it here. So thank you very much. This has been TQ948. Uh, from the book Matrix of the Mind by uh, Ogden. Maybe we'll have some more quotes in the future. Thanks again. Bye for now.